Hey everybody, how's it going? Ooh, ooh, thin turnout today. Good. I guess so, folks. Are I can sympathize. Two day fall break. What is that all about? Spring break's a whole week. That week is very necessary. This two day business. Yeah, that's like yeah. I don't I don't know about that. That's like that's like people saying that their taxes are charitable. You're like, no, you had to do that anyway. Good news for you that you're here. Not so good news for the other folks who aren't here, because what we're talking about today is actually quite difficult. I would say easily the most difficult of the of the uh, Platonic dialogues that we're going to be reading. The last several classes have been getting increasingly more and more difficult as we dive deeper and deeper into Plato's theory of forms. This is going to be the culmination of that discussion. If you're expecting that like, we'll finally get a very clear and concise account of the forms, uh, you might not be satisfied. This is the latest of the dialogues that we'll be reading from Plato. It's also the last of the Platonic dialogues that we're going to be reading. That marker is no good. And the dialogue is, of course, Parmenides. Named after Parmenides, whom we've met already, right? When we read Perifuseos. Maybe the most notable thing about this dialogue? Socrates is... He's the, he's the whippersnapper here, right? There have been like plenty of instances where the relationship between teacher and student has been ambiguous, but I think we've always gotten the impression, even when Socrates is talking to his friends, even very good friends, even old friends like Credo, he's always in control. He's the teacher. Even when it's kind of like, oh, we're going forth together, he's, kind of, he's the leader in the expedition. Not so this time. What we have here is a very young Socrates meeting a much older, more seasoned, more philosophically experienced Parmenides and Zeno, uh, his student, Zeno. So we get Socrates and Zeno and Parmenides. Socrates is about, uh, you know, th there are questions, like with all of these dialogues, questions of like, did this, did this conversation ever actually happen? Did Socrates ever meet Parmenides? And it's possible their lives did overlap. And it's also possible that um, Parmenides came to Athens for the Panhellenic Games at a certain point, that uh, he could have been in Athens, and it was reasonable to expect that he might have been in Athens at the same time that Socrates would have been alive. Uh, if there's like a, a most likely time for this conversation to have happened, it would have been when Parmenides was about like 65, 70-ish, and Socrates was a young kid of about 20. So about, you know, imagine, like your age. It would be like you meeting some kind of old, yeah, yeah, he's, I mean, he's, he's not doing bad for a 20-year-old, but let's be honest, he's, he's getting run around. He's getting led by the nose, he's, he's getting his ass handed to him by Parmenides. There's a certain perverse satisfaction in this, and watching him do this to other people all throughout the other dialogues, it's kind of nice to see somebody return the favor to Socrates. Um, Lest we get wrapped up in all of that kind of stuff, there's actually like a serious conversation going on. This is a late Platonic dialogue, which is to say it's representing Plato's fairly mature thought and a pretty good separation of Plato from Socrates, even though he's still using Socrates as a character, as a mouthpiece for, for like the, the exposition of these ideas. <clears throat> And one of the interesting juxtapositions in this is that we have a young Socrates, but an old Plato. This is a dialogue within a dialogue. Uh, Baird cuts this out, I think, of the edition that you have. There's a whole big introduction that involves somebody named Cephalus, not the Cephalus that we, not Polemicus' father from Republic I, some other guy named Cephalus, who meets Adamantus and Glaucon and says, like, hey, I hear there was a time that Socrates met Parmenides, 
and uh, they talked. Do you anybody? Do you know anybody who was there? And Adamantus and Glaucon are like, we do know somebody who was there. And they take him to that person's house, and they say like, hey, do you, were you there? And he's like, I wasn't there, but I know a guy who was there, and he told me all about it. Here's the story. So like many levels removed from the actual conversation, which we've seen this sort of thing happening before. We saw it in Phaedo. It's a kind of a it's a rhetorical technique that if we were trying to interpret it, we might say this is Plato distancing himself from Socrates. This is him saying, like, this isn't necessarily what Socrates said, but this is what I'm saying. And again, the challenge here is we've got young Socrates and old Plato. Maybe old older Plato. Relatively mature Plato. Relatively immature Socrates as a mouthpiece for relatively mature Plato, which raises this question. When we see this exposition of the theory of forms in Parmenides, are we supposed to be thinking of this as an immature version of the forms? Is this Socrates just starting to get an idea of what the forms are all about? Or are we supposed to be thinking of this as a relatively well-worked-out version of the forms from older Plato? He's not just starting to get the idea and cobbling it together. He's actually really understood the idea quite well. And I think we can probably say uh, it's mostly the latter. Even though we have young Socrates kind of articulating what seems to be a nascent, a kind of incipient theory of forms, we get the impression that the author, this older Plato, knows all the moves ahead of time and is not, he, like, Plato is not confused about what he thinks the theory of the forms needs to be, but perhaps he's aware of some problems. And this is probably the most interesting thing about this dialogue. We haven't seen it yet as such, even though this is kind of the spirit of the Socratic Alenchus. This is Plato lodging a critique of his own theory. We saw something like this in... Mino, towards the end, when Mino makes it clear that he's not going to really be participating in the dialectic back and forth of the Elenchus, and Socrates says, all right, I'll do it myself. I'll use this method of hypothesis. Plato's been working out his theory of forms. Now it's time, once he's worked out his own ideas, to come back and say, like, well, let's make a criticism of it. And what's really remarkable is the criticism is, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say devastating, but it's quite a trenchant critique. He exposes problems in his own theory that are like very, very difficult. In fact, so difficult that we have trouble imagining how it is that this theory could possibly recover from it. If there are possible saving graces, and we'll discuss what those might be towards the, uh, towards the end of this class, it might be that there seem to be no other alternatives that are any better. And here's this kind of like triangulation of, of like various theories that I think we have a pretty good idea of right now that at least we can put them into conversation with one another in this dialogue. There are three main kind of like theoretical characters going on in this dialogue. One of them is fairly clear because the title of the dialogue is Parmenides, and Parmenides and Zeno are there, and they're having this conversation with Socrates. It's Eleatic Monism. So one of the theoretical positions that's on the, on the table in this dialogue is Eleatic monism. The other one is a platonic theory of forms. And there's a third that never really gets mentioned, but I think we can read it into what's going on. And that's a kind of Heraclitian... I'm going to call this infinite plurality. Refresh my memory. What's Eleatic monism all about again? All is one, yep. And in fact, that might not, that might not even be... That might even be a problematic formulation of it, right? And we say, like, everything is one. There is no plurality. There's no change. There's no movement. None of these things. It's everything that we got in Parafuseos by Parmenides. It's everything we got in uh, Zeno's paradoxes that are aiming to show that, like, any alternative to Eleatic monism is just kind of incomprehensible. It's, it's logically contradictory. Rationally incoherent. In fact, we might even go so far as to say that even saying something like all is one 
that, that kind of creates a separation. This idea of like, yeah, we've got the all and then we've got the one. All is one. This is folks who, who get like really into the nitty gritty about this stuff will say something like this problem of predicating oneness about the all. This is maybe making things too complex. You have the subject and you have a predicate. Maybe the better way to say it is to just say being. That's it. Just one word, being. That's all we've got going on. Being is, maybe. But even that starts to make it a little more complicated. That's our Eleatic monism. What was Heraclitus's bag again? What was he talking about? Flux, right? Yeah, flux. All is in a state of ever-changing flux. So we've got this idea of change. And one of the things that comes along with this, and we talked about this a little bit when we were talking about Heraclitus, is that if everything is constantly in a state of flux, then nothing actually sticks around long enough to be anything. You maybe have, over here with aleatic monism, you just have being. In fact, let's, let's put that in capital letters, because it's, it's big. It's not even just big B being. It's all capital letters being. Just being, being. With Heraclitus, no actual being, just becoming. In fact, I'll make it a lowercase b. With Eleatic monism, we have all being, no becoming because there's no change, no motion or anything like that. And with Heraclitus, always becoming, a constant state of flux with nothing sticking around long enough to actually predicate anything of it. Both of these are seemingly rationally coherent accounts of the world, but ones that maybe even seem to like devolve into senselessness. It's hard to say anything interesting about the world from the perspective of Eleatic monism. What are you going to say? You're just going to say being, right? Maybe you could say all is one, but even that starts to become problematic. Very few things that you can say about the cosmos from the perspective of Eleatic monism because there really should be only one thing that you can say about it. It's so all is one. You start saying multiple things, now you're breaking the world up into a plurality. That's no good. That won't work. So, yeah, this is kind of, it's a, it's a coherent account. It's maybe a boring account. You can't say anything interesting about the world from Eleatic monism. You can't really say anything interesting about the world from Heraclitian infinite plurality either because... Nothing ever stays still long enough to actually say anything about it. Constant state of becoming. And the reason why I would say that we have Heraclitian infinite plurality, just to kind of like help put Heraclitus into a, a clearer sort of conversation with the Eleatics here, is that if things are constantly changing and we have constant becoming, then instead of one thing, we have like many things, right? So many things. In fact, an infinite many from moment to moment. As many moments as there are, there are at least that many things, right? Is that clear enough? Why Heraclitus is taking us to this position that is not just talking about everything being in constant flux, not just talking about how we never have any kind of stable being, only a constant state of becoming and perishing, but that this leads to an infinite plurality of things that are always just around for just an instant before they pass away and perish and turn into something else. Does that make sense? Is this thing on? This is a good time to ask questions if you're not following. This, is, this should be review, right? We've talked about all this stuff before. I'm adding a slightly new wrinkle to Heraclitus, but it's, it was there. Would you say that, like, um, I know that for Parmenides, he's, he's really big on rationalism, like, I guess, or just, like, yep. yeah, like, he's not trusting your, your perception, like, what you can see, but, like, your, what you think of in yourself, and that's why, because it doesn't make sense a lot, like, logically through the world, so it's not just be being. Yep. No. So, would you say, um, Heraclitus is, like, the opposite? It's possible, yeah. I think it's, it's not clear exactly where Heraclitus falls on the rationalism and empiricism so debate. He uses examples like the, you can't step in the same river twice, and that's a really big, like... That seems a lot different than our empirical yeah. experience. Our empirical experience is that, like, well, it seems like it's the same river, right? I recognize it from before. 
so he's yeah he's maybe doing a, a little bit of a mixture of both. Also, if we look at like all of the all of the Heraclitian fragments about the logos, it seems like he's definitely got some sort of rationalistic affinities. Then again, he'll come right back around and say that you know the many are find the logos uncomprehending, right? Or un incomprehensible. So uh, he's he's kind of cutting both ways, which maybe isn't like much of a surprise because Heraclitus he he loves these little riddles. He's a He's a philosopher that works in contradictions. Two options, both really weird, both like very, very different than our experience of the world itself. And now a third option. And it seems like what's going on here in Parmenides and elsewhere, really, with Plato's theory of forms, is that he's trying to find a third path, something in between this like all is one business and there's an infinite many with no unity whatsoever to what's going on. Not even the unity that holds things together over time through change, right? Some, some kind of substance underlying the change that holds it together. And think about this for yourself, that you're constantly changing throughout your life, but somehow, but you're always you, right? Something holds you together. Heraclitus says, no, it's not the same you. From moment to moment, it's always different. Parmenides is saying, there's no you because there's no plurality of things. You would have to then be separate from the, the all that is one. And here we have this attempt at a third path that's trying to articulate what the relationship between the oneness of the kind of Eleatic perspective is and the manyness that we could maybe attribute to a Heraclitian perspective. How it is that these relate to one another. How it is that we can get these kind of like mid-range unities amidst pluralities sort of approach. And the key idea that's going on here in this weird space that's in between the Eleatics and Heraclitus is all hinging on this idea of participation. We have a theory of forms and we have concrete particular things that are participating in those forms. The forms somehow lend some unity and the concrete particular things are still concrete particular things that create some sort of plurality and they participate in those forms. And an awful lot of what's going on in the dialogue here that, that kind of ensues is this interrogation of, okay, what the heck is participation? What's going on there? What, like, if, you, if we're going to try to understand a theory of forms, we need to understand what it means to say that concrete particular things participate in the form. And if we can't understand what that means, then we're going to have trouble with the theory of forms. And if we show that participation itself is rationally problematic, then perhaps we're going to find some rational problems lying at the heart of the theory of the forms as well. Questions so far? All right. So that's overview. That's kind of what's going on in this dialogue. Let's get into the dialogue itself. The whole thing opens up with, I think where, where Baird picks it up for you, does, where does he pick it up for you guys? Is it Zeno's just finished talking about something and Socrates chimes in? Is that what's going on? Oh, actually, no, you get, oh, that's interesting. Baird's gone back to a whole lot more of it. Okay, all right, cool, good to know. Where the conversation really gets started after we get this kind of introduction that shows the dialogue within a dialogue structure, is Zeno's just finished giving a big presentation of some new argument that he has. It's an argument against plurality. So Zeno's just given an argument against plurality, and Socrates pipes up. And asks a question. And think of this as, you know, he's the, he's the kid in the class who just heard the professor give, like, a big, a big lecture. And, in fact, it's, it's, a, it's a visiting lecture, right? Zeno's come all the way from Elia to Athens to give this talk. Parmenides has brought him along. Parmenides is the big attraction. Zeno is a student, and Parmenides is like, well, Zeno's going to give an argument here. And Zeno gives this argument against plurality. And Socrates, we don't really get a sense of exactly what it is that Zeno's argument actually is, but Socrates tries to reformulate it and kind of give it back to Zeno. This is the way that Socrates tends to work. Raises his hand and says, it seems like you're making yet another argument against plurality. It seems like um, 
you're saying that the problem with plurality is that is that things, if there are in fact a plurality of things, things would have to be both like and unlike each other. So in fact, if I was to say something like, we have two markers here, a plurality of markers. Socrates is saying, it seems like your argument is saying that the problem here is that we have this marker and this marker. They're like one another insofar as they're markers, but they're unlike one another insofar as this one's over here and this one's over here. This one's green. This one's red. So is that what you're saying, Zeno? You're saying that the problem is that things would have to be both like and unlike one another, and that this is preposterous, because how could things be both like and unlike? This is a contradiction, right? And Zeno seems to agree and say, like, yeah, that's pretty much my argument. And there's even a moment here where Socrates is like, is this genuinely a new argument? Are there, in fact, many arguments against plurality? Which is kind of like a clever little trap there, right? Like, are, are there a plurality of arguments against plurality? Or is it all just one argument? And Zeno even concedes this. He's like, yeah, maybe these are just different facets of the same argument. It seems like my conclusion would have to demand this much, as right, right? That, like, there couldn't possibly be a plurality of arguments against plurality. There would have to be just one, maybe with several different faces. But this is kind of, like, gets gets to the, like, the very heart of this idea, that even if we're going to be talking about one big world, even if we can understand what it is that the Eleatics are talking about, that all is one big humming ball of being, it still does seem like the experience of us two-headed mortals is such that we're seeing different facets of it, that we're seeing this oneness from different perspectives. And this is how we make sense of the world. That all is one, yes, but like we see it in ways that we carve it up into many. And this is the thing that we need to try to explain and understand. Socrates goes on to point out that like this is tricky here, what you've done, Zeno, because I think you've pulled a fast one on us. Sure, it seems like a contradiction to say that things are both like and unlike. It would be like saying that something is both tall and not tall. And we know that this is, this is logically problematic to say that anything is X and not X. But, and... This won't get formulated as such for like another like maybe half a generation. It's going to be Aristotle who's going to put, it, put the formulation just like this. The principle of non-contradiction isn't that things can't be x and not x. There's a little more to it. It's things can't be x and not x at the same time, and here's the big kicker, and in the same respect. Have we been here before? Have we talked about this before? I can't be both in the room and not in the room, right? What about this? Am I in the room and not in the room? Part of me is in the room. Part of me is out of the room. Maybe all we need to do in order to settle this is to get straight on, like, what does it mean to be in the room, right? If I have one toe in the room, does that count as in the room? If my whole body is not in the room, does that mean I'm not in the room? As long as I can get clear on what it means to be in the room, maybe that's true, that I can't be both in the room and out of the room at the same time. I can jump in and out from one time to another. I can be in the room, out of the room. We can say the same thing with alive and not alive. I can't be both alive and not alive at the same time. But I can be alive at one moment, and then after I get hit by a truck, then not alive. Or I could be hit by the truck and in a coma, or brain dead, in which case we would wonder, like, is Adam alive or not alive? And we'd be like, I don't know, maybe, maybe both. And we'd be like, ah, at the same time? Yeah, at the same time. In the same respect? Hard to see how that could be. These two markers are like and unlike one another. But the respect in which they're like one another is different than the respect in which they're unlike one another. Socrates points this out and says, you've pulled a fast one on us here. And here's, I'll, I'll propose an alternative. And this is an alternative that 
really echoes the sort of thing that he works out when he's uh, responding to Seabees' cloak metaphor in Phaedo, when he starts talking about like the, the ways that opposites interact with one another in concrete particulars versus the way that opposites interact with one another in the forms. He says, with concrete particular things, we can have likeness and unlikeness present in different degrees within the markers, right? Or we can say the same thing about tallness and not tallness. That I am just, I'm a concrete particular person, and in one sense I'm tall compared to very, very small people, compared to much taller people, I'm short. Am I tall and not tall at the same time? Yeah, perhaps. In the same respect? Uh, I don't know about this. And the way that Socrates talks about this is he says, concrete particular things, I'll just call these CP things, for concrete particular things, they merely participate in likeness and unlikeness. And you're right that unlikeness and likeness are opposites. And if we're talking about the form of likeness and the form of unlikeness, if we're talking about likeness itself and unlikeness itself, then you're right. These two things can't coexist. They're opposites and, and they're, they, they, don't, they can't mix at all if we're just talking about the forms. There's no part of unlikeness in likeness. There's no part of likeness in unlikeness. But in concrete particular things that are only partially participating in the form of likeness and unlikeness, we could say that those concrete particular things are participating a little bit in likeness and a little bit in unlikeness. And this is how it is that we end up with this kind of what you seem to be saying is an absurd scenario, but clearly it's not absurd. I've got a theory that can speak to this and does a better job than what you're talking about. And it has to do with this way in which concrete particular things are participating in forms. In this realm of the forms, we saw this also when in Phaedo when Socrates was talking about coldness and hotness. The form of coldness itself has no part of hotness. There's no hotness at all in coldness itself. But there are concrete particular things that are kind of hot and kind of cold, partially participating in each. And in fact, we can talk about things whose essences, like in order for them to be what they are, it has to include at least some degree of coldness. Snow or ice, for example, can't be what it is unless it's got like a certain amount of coldness. Gets too hot, it just stops being snow. The number three, it's essential to what it is to have oddness. Three participates in oddness in a way where like if you take any step away from oddness, even a little bit of evenness makes three not three anymore. You can't have three with any evenness. It's got to be odd. Does that make sense? Kind of? It's a weird way of talking about it. But this is the sort of thing that Socrates has been trying to, or Plato has been trying to articulate with his theory of forms. We have concrete particular things. They're participating in these abstract forms. And this is what allows us to talk, to kind of like bridge this gap between the abstract universality that's kind of like the oneness of everything. At the very, very top of all of this, we have one form. It's the form of the good. We saw this in, the, in uh, Republic 6 and 7 at our last meeting, right? The form of the good, if that's the kind of like the dominating metaphor for what's going on in Plato's theory of forms, then we see all of the, the kind of resonance with Eleatic monism. If we focus on what's going on at the bottom of that divided line and we recognize that, like, yes, there are concrete particular things, maybe this is a nod towards Heraclitean infinite plurality as well, and a theory of forms is trying to knit the two together to show how it is that there's some sort of relationship between the concrete particulars and the universal forms that they participate in. Um, is it good, not necessarily like all the world, but Um, yeah, so they that, wait, fit, their, their being is derived uh, from, from that? Yeah, so I feel like it wouldn't not fit with, like, the, 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 the sense that, like, being, you know. Um, it depends on, like, how we look at it. If we were to say something like, because everything gets its being from the sun, mm -hmm. we're all just different manifestations of the sun. In which case we would recognize that, like, yeah, this is all, the fact that we all come from the sun 
is what ties us all together. We're just different manifestations of that divine light, if we want to think about it like this. And like, don't forget that the sun isn't just kind of like a cosmological oddity for the Greeks. It's something that's kind of, it's tied up in their theology. The sun is Apollo. All right. Good so far? More or less? Now Parmenides comes on the scene. After Socrates has given this account, Parmenides and Zeno kind of look at each other, and kind of like give a little knowing glance to one another, like, get a load of this kid. Parmenides is like, I'll, I'll handle this. Step aside, Zeno. Parmenides compliments Socrates in this way that, like, is, you know, we're used to seeing from Socrates. It's almost like it's a, it's a compliment that you're not really sure if it's genuine. You're not really sure if Socrates realizes that it might not be entirely genuine. There's a, the irony is turned back around on Socrates, almost as if Parmenides has come and patted him on the head. He's like, that's very cute. You're like, uh, look at you. You're, you're like a little aspiring philosopher. Stick with it long enough, you might actually get good at it, kid. <laughs> Parmenides starts asking Socrates questions. He's like, what, what, like what, give me this. Uh, this is an interesting theory you have here, this theory of the forms and the way that things participate in them. Tell me, like, are, are you saying that there's a, what, what are the forms? Give me some sense of what the forms are. And we start with examples. It seems like Socrates was suggesting that likeness and unlikeness are forms. Do you agree with that, Socrates? And Socrates is like, yeah, totally, I agree with that. By the way, and we're going to see like a, a slight spin on this sort of argument later on as Parmenides really starts laying into Socrates here. But this one all by itself, to say that likeness and unlikeness are forms and that they are like completely opposed to one another, that's a big problem right off the bat. Does anybody see what it is? Is likeness like unlikeness? That's going to be a problem, right? Likeness can't be like unlikeness. Because unlikeness is the complete privation and negation of likeness. But there's an likeness in that, in that sense that So we're, we're stuck both ways, right? Either unlikeness and likeness are opposed to one another, or they're not opposed to one another. If they're not opposed to one another, I don't know what these two words mean. If they are opposed to one another, then it seems as if the like is unlike, unlike, and now there's a part of unlikeness in likeness. Oh, shit. That's going to be a problem, too. What are the forms? Likeness and unlikeness? And Socrates is like, yep. Likeness and unlikeness. And Parmenides goes on. He's, and other things, too, like um, justice, um, the beautiful, the good, DK. Ta Kalon, ta, Ag ta Agathon, like, uh, are these the sorts of things that you're thinking of when you talk about the forms? And Socrates goes, oh yeah, oh, wait, those are totally forms. What about man? Let's update it. What about the human? Is there like a form of the human? What about fire? What about the form of water? Are those forms? And Socrates says, I don't, I'm not sure about that. Like, I've thought about this before. That's actually a tough one. I'm not, I'm, I'm not really sure what to say about this. I thought about it many times. As a matter of fact, we might notice that this is, uh, this might be getting into territory that would potentially put a platonic theory of forms into conversation with, I don't know, folks like the Milesians, a way of thinking about Fire being, or uh, maybe something like water, right? So Thales saying that water is the, that's the arche of all things. Like, could there possibly be a form of water that would kind of give us a platonic way of understanding what somebody like Thales is talking about? Or if we're going to take Heraclitus to be a material monist and talk about the material, materiality of fire, right? Is there a form of it that could be somehow a platonic version of a Heraclitian idea of like all is in ever-living fire or something like that. 
Or maybe even somebody like Protagoras, who says man is the measure of all things. This is the form of the human. Could this be like, could we get it at it through this? And Socrates is like, I'm not really sure. And in fact, after reading through Republic 6 and 7, perhaps we shouldn't be sure about this either. There are serious questions about whether or not these things are going to be at the top of that divided line. Are these going to be the sorts of things that are like, that are open to the sort of knowledge that we called episteme, right? Remember we had this divided line? With the sensibles down here and the intelligibles up here. And there was a distinction down within the sensibles and a similar distinction up here within the intelligibles, such that we had this one, Dionysus, and this one, Episteme, as distinct ways of knowing with distinct objects. And the way that Socrates and Plato were distinguishing between the two is he said that at this level in Dionysus, we're always taking our hypotheses. There's a, there's a kind of way in which we're talking about the abstract forms that are based off of sense experience. And it never really quite gets away from sense experience. One way of thinking about this is that these are abstractions from sense experience. So if we are going to say that there's a form of water, perhaps it's that we see and feel and taste water. We come to know water through the senses, and then we abstract from all of our experiences of water to say, what is it that they all have in common, right? This is very, very different. You, maybe one of the ways of thinking about this is, could you ever come to an idea of what water is without your senses altogether? Could you just sit and think and arrive at the form of water? Unlikely, right? You would have to have some sense experience in order to talk about a form of water. So this isn't the highest level of knowledge where Socrates is suggesting that like these things, they take intelligible things as their hypotheses and they end up with intelligible conclusions. We're completely in the realm of abstract thought up here in episteme. This is why we might say something like justice. I need not have any concrete experiences in order to talk about what justice might be. It's harmony. It's everybody getting what they need. I need not have any political experience to know that that's what justice is. Everybody getting what they deserve, perhaps. And what do they deserve? Whatever they need in order to be their best. So yeah, definitely. This one, uh, maybe not. Par Parmenides gives him another option. He says, what about things like hair and uh, mud? What about hair and mud? Are there forms of hair and mud? And Socrates is like, absolutely not. There are not forms. That's, that's ridiculous. No forms there. And we can start to get some sense of like why it is that Socrates is going to have to cut this off, or why it is that Plato is going to have to cut this off. If we say that there's a form of everything, it quickly runs completely like off into the slippery slope into Heraclitian infinite plurality. Is there a form of, is there a form of hair? If there's a form of hair, why not a form of brown hair that's dis distinct from the form of red hair, right? And if there's a form of brown hair, then why not a form of this brown hair, this one right here that I've got like in my fingers? And if there's a form of this brown hair, then why not a form of this brown hair now versus a form of this brown hair now at two different moments? We can see how like if I, I just keep saying that there's a form of something, like anything that I can think of has a form, then suddenly we're, we've just kind of like gone off of this this. If, if there was like a narrow sort of a razor edge kind of middle path between Eleatic monism and Heraclitian infinite plurality, you start making a couple of concessions and it's hard to tell where to stop. Once the camel gets his nose under the tent flap, you know, you've heard this one before? The camel's nose problem? Oh, uh, it's a slippery slope sort of thing. Like you, if the camel gets his nose on, into the tent, then pretty soon his whole head is going to be in the tent. And once his head's in the tent, then the rest of his neck, and then his shoulders, and pretty soon the whole camel's in the tent. As we all know with our extensive experience with camels. Cats do it too. What's that? Cats do that too. Cats do that as well? Yeah. All right. I believe it. 
So we've got, what we've got here is the potential for a slippery slope. And already we've got this sense that like, you start making a couple concessions in this one direction, and pretty soon, like, boom, we go all the way over into Heraclitean infinite plurality. We're going to find that we've got the same sort of thing going on here, where like, you make a couple concessions the other way, boom, you slide all the way down this slope into Eleatic monism. And Socrates is desperately, through this entire conversation, trying to hold on to this middle ground trying not to slide off either into Heraclitean infinite plurality or into Eleatic monism. He's trying to hold steady with this, like, there are a plurality of things. There are concrete particular things, and it's not an infinite plurality. It's like they, there is some unity, and that unity comes from the forms. And the way that this works is that the concrete particular things participate in the forms. And the forms can't just be any old thing. There are only like a certain, certain number of what they can possibly be. Parmenides is like, all right, I see, I see what you mean, I think. But answer me this. Oh, I got it just a little bit ahead of myself. There's a little more back and forth here between Parmenides and Socrates, in which Parmenides tries to pin down Socrates on exactly what it is that he's talking about when he's talking about the forms. This is just kind of the opening salvo. There are four properties of the forms that, that Parmenides is able to kind of like pull out of Socrates that I think are important to recognize. And everything else that happens in the rest of this dialogue, in the rest of the first half of this dialogue at least, you don't even have the second half of it in Baird, don't. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, has to do with trying to articulate how these four different properties of forms seem to not really be able to coexist with one another. So the forms are pure. That's the first one. The forms are pure, which is to say there is no admixture of opposites. For example, if there is a form of justice, there is no injustice at all in justice. It's not even a little bit unjust. It's completely just. If tallness were a form, then there's no shortness in tallness. So the forms are pure. The forms are distinct. They are, that is to say that they are separate from the concrete particulars. The forms are not the same thing as the concrete particulars. There is no identity between me and the form of, I don't know, would it be the form of me? The form of a human? Yeah. No, no identity between, like a concrete particular table is not the form of a table. The concrete particular instantiations of justice are not the form of justice. Forms are distinct from the concrete particular things that are participating in them. The third one's kind of complex. There are two sides to it. Um, the forms are unified. Unified and unifying. Which is to say they provide a unity to a plurality of concrete particular things. And we've seen this many times before. We saw this in, in Mino. You know, in almost every early dialogue, there's this moment where somebody throws out a whole bunch of examples. We get a swarm of bees. And then Socrates says, yes, but what do they all have in common? This is the idea, the idea that the forms are unifying. But more importantly, and we get this idea in Phaedo, in the argument, f uh, what was, it was the um, argument from affinity early on in Phaedo, that the forms are themselves unified. They have no composite parts. They are a non-composite whole. And last but not least, the forms are self-predicating. which is maybe a new kind of spin on the forms are pure, but uh, it's a re relatively important one. That's to say that, like, when I say that the forms are self-predicating, that's to say that the good is good, 
and justice is just, and beauty is beautiful. Whatever it is that the forms apply to themselves. This is what we mean when we say that they're self-predicating. We can recognize this is maybe going to create some problems with things like tallness is tall or shortness is short. All right. So these are the things that Socrates gets pinned down on. And it seems like these are relatively good ways of continuing to flesh out our, theory, our, our idea of what Plato's theory of forms are. Plato kind of willingly lets Socrates commit to all these ideas. And we can see that like, one way of looking at this dialogue is this interrogation of, all right, are we going to be able to hold on to all four of these at the same time? Because all of Parmenides' critiques from here on out are identifying ways in which these are potentially in conflict with one another. Yes? Um, that's interesting, uh, because justice is just. I'd have to go back and look at, if you can find me some passages where, where that's what's going on, then. To do the right thing, right? That, just, that, that doing justice is itself a just thing to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and maybe this gets complicated in, in Republic too, where we would like question whether or not somebody like, if somebody like Gyges does not in fact get what he deserves. Doing injustice, well maybe that does work. Doing injustice is unjust. If I do injustice and I, I reap all the benefits from it, things that I don't deserve, then that's unjust. Yeah, doing injustice is unjust. Is doing justice just? Well, in that same thought experiment we have the just sucker who does all the right things but doesn't get any reward for it. In fact, perhaps gets punished for it. So we have a situation there where we would say justice is maybe, maybe not just. To do just things doesn't actually give everybody what they need. But I think that there's, there's still a, I think that there's a, a very reasonable way of reading what's going on in apology, credo, and um, Republic 1 and 2 where we get some sense that, like, no, Socrates may still, like, he may still be holding fast on this and saying that, like, no, everybody does get what they deserve, right? If I do this just thing and it seems like I'm being harmed for it, we can say in a variety of ways that, no, I'm not being harmed. My soul is still intact. I'm going to die, but how bad is dying if the soul is immortal? Maybe. Think of your children. I am thinking of my children. I'm giving them what they need, a good role model, somebody who does the just thing at every Every opportunity never shies away from doing what they think is right. Yeah, I think there, there's something definitely like that going on. But it's contentious, right? It's the sort of thing where we seriously have moral dilemmas ourselves about this. These questions about, should I do the just thing? Is justice just? Is doing what is just? Is giving everybody what they deserve? Is that going to bring everybody what they deserve? Including me. Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah. I'm having a hard time trying to figure out what Socrates' explanation of the forms are, because it sounds like he's going more so on abstract ideas and not so much concrete ideas. Like, yeah, are ideas concrete? Well, when uh, when he was asked about like likeness and unlikeness, justice, beauty, and good, he was like, yeah, sure, but he started tripping up on things like man, fire, hair, and mud. Well, he's, I don't know if he's tripping up on them. He's, he's denying it. He's saying, like, no, absolutely. Like, hair and mud, these are not forms. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's tripping up. But I think on this one, he's quite clear. He's like, nope, that's, that's ridiculous. And that, that leads us to kind of bizarre things. He's unsure about whether to include these. And I think I, it's unclear how we should read this with respect to Plato's actual theory. I think, I think at the very least, we should be suspicious of these as forms. If these are the sorts of things that get us into trouble in Parmenides' ensuing arguments, then we might think to ourselves, like, well, maybe it's because our examples weren't legit forms. Well, what I'm uh, asking is, like, it seems like, like fire, water, and man, they all have, like, physical forms, but you can't, like, when it comes to justice, beauty, and good, you can't really, like, they don't really affect your senses, is what I'm trying to say. Like, yes. can you taste justice? Can you That's right. feel it? Or, and, but you can, you can 
feel a human, you can feel fire. That's why the forms are on the top of the divided line, right? In the intelligible realm and not in the sensible realm. And they're not even on that lower part of the intelligible realm that takes its, that gets kind of tangled up in, in physical sensation. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I was asking. I'm having a hard time just trying to figure out what Socrates is, what, what point he's trying to make. Oh, it sounds like, it sounds like you've got him perfectly. Like, this is exactly what he's saying about the forms, that they are pure and in, purely intelligible, that there's, there's nothing about sensation going on in the forms. The forms are, they're ideas that kind of can exist independent of bodily sensation. And in fact, if there's anything interesting going on in bodily sensation, then it somehow comes from the forms, but there's, there's got to be a clean break someplace. For Socrates, or for, for Plato, at least if we're following what's going on in that divided line, we have that sensible, intelligible break that goes halfway up the line. Not halfway up the line, but it, it's the, the big division between the bottom two sections and the top two sections. Um, and so we can argue over, like, well, where is, where is the, the, that hard break between sensible and intelligible? We could say it's here. We could also maybe say it's here because as... As he points out, he's like, ah, these things are still kind of somehow tangled up in sensibility. Dionysus is not quite pure intelli purely intelligible. It's trying to talk about intelligible things in sensible things. It's talking about the abstract patterns in sensation. Whereas episteme, that top section, that's just talking about like pure abstraction. Now the tough part might be this question of like, all right, well, how is, then how are, how is all the stuff that's going on up here, how does that apply to everything down here if it talks about nothing sensible, right? And we might even think of, we talked about this, I think, a little bit at our last meeting where we were thinking about how is it that the form of the good informs everything down below, everything down below? I can definitely get how, like, good is related to beauty and justice and virtue, maybe, but is good, like, does good inform hoarseness? And we talked a little bit about how this, this could conceivably work. I just, if I want to think about hoarseness, what do I think of when I think about hoarseness? Do I think of a, do I think of a sick, starving, ill-tempered horse? Or do I think of, like, the best horse? Is hoarseness, hoarseness itself? Is it, like, is it the best of horses? Is it kind of tied to what it is that a good horse would need to be in order to be a horse? We say the th same thing about like, the form of a human. If there is a form of a human, is it the ideal human? Is the form of the human, is it a virtuous human? And when we talk about folks who aren't completely virtuous, are they just, the problem is they're only partially participating in that form of the ideal human. This is that this relationship between ideas and the ideal. That's a big part of what's going on in Plato's theory of forms. Yes? Um, maybe we could see that there wouldn't be a form of a human because part of being human is like that physical aspect. And like in the forms, perhaps there wouldn't be like a difference between the souls of like an animal or, or like a, a human or something like that. Like, because then, like, if we go, like, I don't know, I know, that this, I know this might not be the most credible in terms of, like, in the Republic, of the myth of Ur, like, uh, the soul, like, the way that Plato described it, even though we don't know if he's saying it just the same as, like, a man, or like, that's how we actually believe that, you know, the, when the souls, well, when you die, your soul will up to be judged, and, you know, like, you choose a new life, and you look into, you know, everything, you could be an animal, or, like, you could be, you know, a, Again. So, and in fact, you'll you'll get probably what you deserve, right? Yeah, if you're yeah. if you're a person who's like consumed with bodily desire, then you're probably gonna want to become an animal. So, so you're right? not really you're you're you're, you're a soul in the forms, like the realm of the forms, but you're not like a human in the sense, like the, like what we yeah like, you know, like, oh, yeah. This is this is tough. Yeah, and like we can be we can we can be dubious about how much trust we should put in a myth, yeah. right? This is like, myth is, myth is always like a big kind of scare quote around everything that follows, especially in Plato. But I would still say, even, even if it's like without the myth, there's still the fact that like, uh, a really big part of being human or even horse is like a physical aspect. Like you walk upright. Yeah. And, and, and so like, Perhaps, yeah. the appetite and, you know, and things like that. And if, if mm -hmm. in the forms we don't really have a body, like the realm of the forms, so, you know, because the 
then yeah, maybe that makes no sense to yeah. talk about, like, or to talk about like you being human. Is like, is the form of human? Is it a human? Right? We might have problems with self-predication. Is the form of a human a human? A human? Yeah, maybe that's not the right. Is the form of human human? Even that's kind of problematic, right? An ideal human? But even then, the goal, the, the object is trying to, like, the reason, you don't have reason rule over everything, and the best way to have reason rule over everything is like, to be the soul. Like, right. So. And at least Plato is flirting with this idea, if not outright endorsing it, that if you did let reason completely, like, have its, have its like, full reign, then maybe you wouldn't need a body at all. We're still playing around with this this idea, and I, I think we can we can certainly give this we'll give this to Plato, and I'll I'll feel comfortable about suggesting that this is what Plato is up to, just because I know we're going to be able to follow it up with Aristotle and kind of say something that might seem a little more sensible. Yeah, Plato flirts with this idea enough that I think we can probably say that he probably believes it is that the ideal human soul is one that has no body. It's just rationality. Now we might critique that and say like. Bullshit, Plato. Humans got to have bodies, otherwise they're not human. In which case, maybe we would say, like, all right, well, then you and Plato disagree about this. All right. Parmenides offers three critiques of this theory of forms, or he lays three traps. He introduces three problems for this theory of forms as it's been laid out here by Socrates, both in kind of responding to like, well, uh, are these, is this a form? Is this a form? What about these? Uh, we're not so sure. All right, and these four properties of forms that he gets Socrates to commit to. The first of these traps has to do with this question of The relationships of parts and wholes when it comes to participation. Parmenides says to Socrates, hey, tell me, when a concrete particular thing participates, pay attention to like the, the repetition of these word roots too, right? A particular thing participates. We get that part. When a concrete particular thing participates in a form, does it participate partially or does it participate entirely? Which is to say, does it take on the whole of the form at once or does it only take on part of the form? And either way you do this, we're going to have some serious problems. If the participation is whole, which is to say, when the concrete particular thing participates in the form, it participates in the entirety of the form. The entirety of the form is present in the particular thing. And we have, que we have a problem with distinctness. If the entirety of the form is present in the concrete particular thing when it participates, then what's the difference between the form and the concrete particular thing that participates in it? That's a little bit slippery, but it's something to try to keep in mind. If the participation is whole, well then why not, if we're talking about justice for example, if individual concrete particular political acts participate wholly in justice, then all of those acts would be completely just, right? In fact, it seemed like when Socrates was responding to Zeno and talking about like, how it is that things can be both like and unlike one another, he says, well, they're partially like one another and they're partially unlike one another. So it seems like the idea here is that, no, we can't have whole participation. It has to be partial participation. But if it's partial participation, then 
The form has parts. And we have a unity problem. Because the form can't have parts. We said it didn't. We said that it was a unity with no composite parts. Which way is it going to be? Can't be either way. And if it can't be either way, so this is like this is a much nastier for Socrates is accustomed in his in his uh, kind of dialogues with his interlocutors and offering these dilemmas, offering these forks, and asking his interlocutor, which way do you want to go on this? Parmenides has kind of done one better, one better, one worse. I don't know. He's kind of like upped it a little more. He said, like, here's your dilemma, and notice you can't go either way. Either way is going to be a really, really big problem for you. You can't go with whole because that kind of seems to defeat the purpose of talking about how concrete particular things are distinct from and merely participate in the forms, aren't the same thing as the forms. And if you want to talk about partial participation, now your forms have to have parts. And Socrates says, well, think about it like this. Uh, like maybe, maybe, it's, uh, maybe it's not that tricky, or maybe, it's, maybe it is tricky, but like we just have to kind of stretch our minds to think about it. Maybe it's the way in which um, a moment participates in a day. Is the moment distinct from the day? I don't know about that. Yeah, sure, the moment is, well, it's distinct and not distinct, right? You can think of the concrete particular as like a moment within a day. The form is the day, the concrete particular thing is the moment, or a certain period of time within the day. It doesn't participate entirely within it, but at the same time, eh, isn't entirely distinct from it either. Maybe, is this, is this what we mean? And Parmenides says, are you saying it like this? And he switches up the analogy just a little bit. He says, are you thinking of it like a sail? We'll put like a sail over like this entire class of people. We'll put a sail over all of them. Are you saying like the form is like a sail that covers all of the individual particular things? And they're participating in it, not in its entirety. Is the whole of the sale over each person? Is only part of the sale over each person? But it does seem like, no, nah, the problem doesn't go away with either analogy. Whether we're talking about the day and the moment, this breaks the day up into parts, right? Into temporal parts. We're, we're, we're started dividing the day up into temporal parts. Beginning of the day, middle of the day, end of the day. This moment, this moment, this moment. Same with the sale. If we're thinking about it, it covers many things and unifies them together. The form is like a sail that covers a bunch of concrete particular things that are participating in the sail. And that doesn't really work either because it kind of demands that the sail be the sort of thing that gets spatially divided up. So this is a really big problem. And Socrates doesn't really seem to have much of an answer to it, which leads us to believe that possibly older Plato doesn't really have an answer to this as well. He's identified that there's a really serious critique in his theory of forms, and it has to do with this question of, like, I can't decide which of these two things is the case when we talk about participation. And this is a central concept to the theory. Not only can I not figure out which of these two things it is, it seems like it can't be either one. And it seems like it's hard to think of how there could be any other option besides whole, complete participation versus partial participation. So that's our first criticism, and it's a doozy. You guys get what's so, what's so difficult about that, what's so problematic? A couple of thumbs up, a couple of nods, a couple of people struggling to keep their eyes open. Are we ready to move on to the second criticism? Second criticism is what's come to be known now as the third man argument. gets called the third man argument when Aristotle makes it, kind of recapping this criticism of the theory of forms, and the example that he uses is man. But Parmenides brings it up as um, a question of largeness. Now, there are all kinds of problems that we can have
have with the form of largeness uh, that have to do with things like self-predication. This is like all, the third man argument really kind of takes dead aim at self-predication and just keeps hammering it over and over and over again. One of the problems with self-predication is that we're going to have this question of whether or not largeness is large. And if we might say that, yeah, largeness is large. Sure, I guess so. There are many large things, and if largeness kind of like includes all of the large things, I guess largeness is larger than all the large things. So largeness is large. You say that enough times, it sounds, you get, that's a weird word, large. 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 But if that's the way we're going to think about it, then we've got a, like a very similar sort of problem, or like the, the opposite sort of problem, in fact, with smallness. Is smallness small? If largeness is larger than all the large things, is smallness going to be smaller than all the small things, but yet it includes all the small things? This is really, really weird. That's one way of approaching this. Parmenides doesn't even really hit that very hard, though. He comes up with this idea of, like, if largeness is self-predicating, we have all these large things, and largeness itself, if largeness is large and all the large things are large, then largeness and all of the large things have something in common. There's maybe a, if we ask ourselves, like, what is it that they all have in common? And we say it's largeness. That raises an interesting question here. Let's use a different color real quick. Let's call all the, all the large things L1, L2, L3, and I'll use lowercase l's to indicate that they're concrete particular large things. These are all the concrete particular things that are large. Some of them are like only partially large. They're large in comparison. They're like me, like kind of sort of large, I guess, compared to some things not as large compared to others. And then there's also largeness itself. If largeness is self if all forms are self-predicating, then largeness itself is large. It shares something in common with all the individual large things. What does it share in common with all those? Some other kind of largeness. Kind of like an overarching, an uber-largeness. We'll call that largeness too, revealing that the first form of largeness was just, it's just a, a proto-largeness, that largeness and all of the large things, I, I keep saying large, it's weird, it's starting to get really weird in my ear. Let's do it with man. There are individual men, and then there's the form of man. Does the form of man share something in common with all of the individual men? Sure. What is it that that shares in common? Some abstract manliness. But it can't be the same thing as the form of man itself. It has to be some third thing, some third man. This is a, this is a weird argument. And plenty of ink has been sold, spilled over this. There are like philosophers, professional philosophers today who are still writing on this third man argument. Do you get where the problem comes from? You don't like it? You don't like the argument or you, because you think it's flawed or because you're like, oh, this is a big problem for the theory of forms? Or? It's, it's a very large problem and a problem. Yeah, it is a large problem. How large is the problem? It's like the, it's, yeah. It's not largeness itself, but it's a large problem. Yeah. And largeness itself, if it's large, then there's got to be some overarching large prime that contains both. In fact, this is a, one way of thinking about this if, you're, if you are like more into logic or mathematics. Um, there are some set theoretical paradoxes that start to get into this sort of stuff as well. These questions of like, what about the, you know, is there a set of all sets? And you're like, yeah, sure, there's a set of all sets. Well, what about, does the set of all sets, it would have to contain itself then. So the set of all sets gets one more set. It's like the set of all sets plus now the set of all sets. Oh, now I've got another set, so I've got to put that inside of it. Does that make sense as well? Yeah, okay. So if I'm just thinking of like all the, all the large things, here are all the various large things, and I, yeah, all right, this is a much, I, I, 
thank goodness, I've figured out a way to represent this graphically. And it's way, way easier. Here are all the large things, and here's largeness itself that unifies all the large things and kind of brings them together. It's what they all have in common. And if the forms are self-predicating, then largeness itself is large. So we need to contain that in a set of all large things. And here, there's, there's large too. And if the forms are self-predicating, then that's large as well. So we need yet another set of large things that contains that large thing. And it goes on and on and on and on ad infinitum. This is a favorite trick of Zeno. This is a, a, a clever Eleatic trick that we see over and over and over again. And Socrates has no response to this. He tries a couple of times. He says, uh, but what if, the, uh, yeah, what if the forms are just ideas? And Parmenides says, yes, but ideas are always ideas of something, right? And if you're going to stick with this idea that the forms are self-predicating, then the something itself, like now I, if I have, if the ideas are always of something, now start thinking of like the something that the idea is an idea of. Now you have an idea of the something that the idea is an idea of. And that's an idea too. And all ideas are ideas of something. So now you have to have an idea of the something that the idea of the something that the, do you see how this goes? It's a problem. It, it, it just keeps on stacking. That's our third man argument. Socrates even responds, he says like, no, 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 what if the forms are patterns? They're patterns in nature. And Parmenides says, are the patterns similar to the things that participate in the patterns, that evince the patterns? And Socrates is like, yes. And he says, then you've got the same problem again. It's going to keep stacking. That third man argument is really nasty and hard to get away from. Logicians love it because it's got this kind of like self-referential recursive thing going on. Lots of weird logical problems have that form. Um, am I completely out of time or only almost out of time? Only almost out of time. Good. Last but not least, Parmenides articulates what he says the greatest problem is. As Socrates is sitting there scratching his head about this third man argument, Parmenides says, I haven't even gotten to the biggest problem with your theory of forms that you just told me about now. The biggest problem is this. The forms seem to be unknowable to any concrete particular person. And anybody who could know the forms who would presumably be like a god or something like this, maybe a disembodied human who's kind of like, kind of opened themselves to pure rationality itself. Anybody who was a god and understood the forms could not understand the concrete particulars. And he puts this in a very kind of a clever way. He says, um, he says, any, any x, if, if x is a form, and y is, let's see, if, if x is a form, and y is what it is in relation to x, then y has to be a form as well. If x is a form, and y is what it is in relation to x, then y has to be a form as well. The example that he gives with this is master and slave. He says, look, master and slave, the m capital M masterness and capital S slaveness themselves, they are what they are in relation to one another. Slave is a concept that only kind of makes sense in relation to the concept of master. Now is the concept of master, is it the master of some individual concrete slave? Ooh, I don't know about this. Concrete individual masters are the masters of concrete individual slaves. So not only can we say that if x is a form, we could also say if x is a concrete particular, and y is what it is in relation to x, then y is going to be a concrete particular thing as well. This is a peculiar sort of like argument to make, and we're wondering, like, where does it go? Parmenides says, the way that this works is with knowledge. If we're talking about the ideal form of knowledge, what on the divided line... Plato called episteme, that form of knowledge that is proper to the forms. 
we're talking about the ideal form of knowledge, that's the kind of knowledge that's required for understanding the forms. But it seems that no concrete particular human is capable of knowing that kind of knowledge. If no concrete particular human is capable of that kind of knowledge, then they're not going to have access to the objects of that knowledge. All of their knowledge is going to be lowercase k knowledge, and it's going to be knowledge of concrete particular things, not of these forms, presuming that they exist. So for humans, for two-headed mortals, this is maybe kind of familiar territory for the Eleatics, for Parmenides in particular. For two-headed mortals, if they have any knowledge at all, it's lowercase k knowledge of concrete particulars and only concrete particulars. They go that way. If anybody had capital K knowledge of the forms, that knowledge would not be able to relate to concrete particular things. The ideal form of knowledge doesn't relate to concrete particular things, only the kind of the, this lesser knowledge that merely participates in the ideal form of knowledge. That's how we know concrete particular things, with just kind of partial participation in that ideal form of knowledge. That's the greatest problem. If there are gods that can know these forms, they can't see the world as concrete particular things. You've only got two possible ways of looking at the world, this way and this way. And Socrates is like, ah, but I want to do this way. And it seems like we all do this way. All right, I'll stop there. Uh, there's going to be a new reading assignment. It's going to be Aristotle. And uh, yeah, we'll pick it up from there on Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs>